Hi everyone, welcome to the My Innovation podcast. Today we're talking about deep tech. It's an exciting world. A lot has changed over the last two years, three years, and we're now seeing an emergence of rush off AI deep tech companies at the forefront. And today we're honored to be graced by some experts, entrepreneurs, and deep experts um, in the space. So we've got Dr. Professor Andy Pardo, Dr. Shweta Singh, and Dr. Marcus Ong. To start with, deep tech is a, is a confusing topic. And, and so I was gonna start with getting Professor Andy to share what, what is deep tech? Yeah, fantastic. So deep tech is really a bit of a catch-all term, to be honest with you. So it covers a wide range of different technologies, obviously AI being one of them, but it can cover things like quantum, blockchain, all sorts of different technologies. Um, that really are on that sort of frontier of technology. So deep tech is really about research-based technology and applications. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the deep tech startups and companies are having to do real sort of deep research in order to produce the capabilities, the applications, the products that they need to do. So deep tech covers a wide range of technologies, but it also covers a wide range of industries where those technologies are implemented. And, uh, and, and that's great for us because we get to work with such a broad base of founders and companies. Nice, so, so not to be biased, because you work with many of them, What's your most exciting deep tech innovation that you have seen? Well, of course, I'm a professor of AI, so I would have to say artificial intelligence. <laughs> but um, I think one of the interesting things that is coming up quite soon is quantum and quantum and AI sort of can work yeah. quite closely together. But obviously what we've seen over the last couple of years with the large language models and, and sort of chat GPT, and others um, are really creating that sort of general purpose AI, which we've never really seen before. And so we're seeing huge applications across many different industries to sort of figure out where these technologies can really support and help businesses. Nice. So Dr. Schroeder, I'd love to hear a little bit about just your background and, and your most exciting deep tech solution. Um, so my background, uh, I actually am a professor in Warwick Business School. I'm also affiliated with the Allen Turing Institute as a behavioral data scientist. Mm -hmm. And I'm a fellow at the Institute of Global Sustainability Development. So I have these three hats, uh, which I kind of uh, juggle with. And in terms of, and in terms of you know, the most exciting you know, innovation which I have seen moving forward is, is obviously the Gen AI, the chat GPT. You know, yeah. so I think things have changed after that drastically, dramatically. I mean, you name it, you know, everybody is just talking about it or using it or, you know, doing it, something with it. <clears throat> so, 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 yeah. It's when Samsung try and sell me a TV or a phone and they're like, look at our Galaxy Air. I was like, I don't care. <laughs> Great, well done. I'm expecting that to be a part and parcel of what your product has. But it's interesting that it is everywhere. Yeah. So much so it's a, people will just throw it around. But... I think some people, like Dr. Marcus, you're using it in a really exciting way, but to start with, please tell us what, what it is you've achieved and, and then your most exciting bit of, of deep tech, or it might be Gen AI again. <laughs> thanks very much, and thanks for inviting me today. So yeah, my background, um, I'm the CEO of Patches Health, which is um, an AI-powered communication platform for healthcare. We cover around 20% of the NHS, around 10 million patients. And one of the things that we really wanted to do when we started was um, improve the way in which um, general practice is actually able to work by making things more efficient, by using AI technology such as AI to optimize a lot of their processes. So. Um, in, in the early days, it's quite quite changed quite a lot. You know, we started sort of five years ago d doing that kind of technology. So as I mentioned, Gen AI is really transforming that now. And what's really interesting is um, a few years ago, people were quite nervous about this kind of technology, um, but now everybody's asking for it. And it's like, why don't you do that? have Gen AI? Why aren't you doing this and that? And that? So um, I think it's a really exciting time, but it's also a time where there's a lot of different um, challenges 
challenges that people are facing as a result of it, um, such as accessibility issues, um, regulatory issues around safety and all those kind of things. So we're really interested in sort of how those things might evolve over time. Nice. So the safety bit is, is interesting. Obviously everyone thinks of Skynet and the Terminator and what happens when these things become conscious and is there a future where it goes horrendously wrong? Or are we starting to see bad actors and, and things happening? And Dr. Shreta, it'd be interesting to get your thoughts from an ethics point of view. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I can like, give you a very simple example. I mean, so Microsoft launched a chatbot, Thai. Within 24 hours, Thai has to be taken down because Thai was learning all kinds of racist slurs which people were saying and was basically using it. So Microsoft has to take it down. And, and I think the, 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 the question about safety, the question about ethics kind of comes really interesting in, in this mix because the idea is AI amplifies the societal biases, heightens what we have as humans by that multiplied by n number of times. So the training models you have is basically containing the biases of all the, 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 the models, all the humans it has been trained on and all the biases they have been carrying around. So the question becomes, well, what do you do to sort of, you know, fight about it? And that's where the challenge is. I mean, how to train these, these models, which do not contain the biases, but the, the models are trained using human data, which has to have biases because, you know, that's how humans are. So, uh, I mean, biases is the reason why we're the most dominant species, right? We, we made decision at certain points, use the gut instinct, your type one and type two thinking for those who've read um, the art of thinking fast, thinking slow. So there are times where decisions need a lot more time to be taken, the analysis, the thorough rigidity, but it almost feels like it's a proliferation. And, and we don't have the opportunity to put the right containment. It's a book that I read, um, Suleiman Mustafa, called uh, The Coming Wave. So he's the founder of DeepMind, and it goes through the idea that the notion of there are parallel deep tech solutions that are coming to the forefront at the same time. You've got quantum, you've got med tech and, and biohacking and that side of world, you've got AI and you've got chips. As a result of all of them coming together, <laughs> without any strategy to, to manage that. And I'm wondering if there's anything you've come across, Spada, in that sort of realm that starts to put the safeguards in place in the real world, because it's great to have it theoretical, but mm. how do we put this stuff in place? Yeah, it's interesting, right? And I think we're at this really interesting point in human history where we're building technology that has a capability from an intelligence perspective that is as good on narrow applications as humans so this we've never experienced this before and i think combining that with all of these other te technologies coming together as you say and the exponential change that that is just accelerating faster and faster and we've seen this over the last couple of years where since the first launch of of chat gpt we're seeing many more large language models, huge improvements in capability. There are still issues with it and there are challenges. And I think what what really happened was we saw the, the art of the possible, if you like, with these language models. What we're now all trying to do with responsible AI and ethics and all of the the sort of guide rails that we need to build to sort of make the applications more real world focus so that they can actually do the job in the real world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're starting to see now. And we, what a lot of businesses and founders and innovators are doing is saying, okay, we've got these large language models, but let's build an industry specific one that is really good at that particular task. And therefore it's improving its capability but that needs to be combined with the ethics the responsible sort of approach to this making sure that they don't spin out of control and start swearing at your customers and all these kind of crazy things that we've sort of seen over the last sort of six months or so so the the interesting stroke frustrating thing for me is that it's easy to do the simple stuff now with these technologies 
the real the hard yards are actually building all of the guide rails and the you know making sure that the the ethics have have been considered making sure you've got a responsible capability and that it's actually delivering what what you need it to do and nothing else and that's part mm. of the challenge but you're absolutely right the technology is moving so fast now it makes it more difficult for startups and innovators because by the time you've come up with an idea and built it potentially someone else has already solved that problem and that actually is the biggest challenge i see and i from my own sort of consulting work i have this challenge as well that we'll work on a project but by the time we deliver it there's a new version of the tech that kind of supersedes the capability and so the client's like oh can we just upgrade the the llm to do this now and so it's going so fast all the time that i think it makes it more challenging for people that are trying to create startups and do innovative deep tech technologies because you know there are the fundamental research side to that but it's going so fast now it's a real challenge i think there's an interesting bit about going fast and in some industries that it's probably better that they don't go that fast mm. healthcare i don't want my surgeon <laughs> rushing <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. I, you, I want them to take their time i want them to be really considered i want them to know exactly where they're making the little slit yeah. right and, and i hope they do that yeah. but the healthcare system especially the nhs is slow potentially too slow to debate on whether it should be quicker to change and adopt change but also there's reasons why so all the things like guardrails in place uh, how have you actually got your product in five years to that large percentage of the UK population, like 10 million. Mm, yeah. That's unbelievable. Like <laughs> no, like what, how? <laughs> like, <laughs> genuinely. I think actually, um, medicine is in quite a good position around this because um, there's been a lot of regulatory things around medicines and so they have a lot of processes in place around requirements for monitoring and evaluation and all those kind of things of collecting the evidence so i'd say actually the mhra is actually one of the leading bodies in in this so we did go through a process we we work with the university of manchester a lot and actually evaluating the ai testing it um, and then we went through the whole regulatory process with the MHRA to get our medical device registration. And I think that's been really good. Um, I think it's interesting how it evolves from now though, because a lot of people, um, what people call is like a wrapper around chat GPT, because they have the large language model underneath and they've just put something above it too, but they don't really control the model itself. They're not able to evaluate it properly. So, and they're not able to change it really beyond some simple fine tuning. So in that case, what controls do you have over um, your model and how do you get it certified? So that's quite interesting, but you still want to be able to bring these technologies through. Um, so I, th I think there's now an openness around using the technology a lot more people are keen to do it they see the benefits it's just about trying to do it in the right way um, and we want to make sure that um, the companies are doing it in the right way there's other ones coming in that it's kind of a shortcut to market right so yeah. by using these technologies um, without going through that proper process to make sure that they're doing things in the right way because also if they do something wrong it hinders everybody else um, everyone gets tarred with the same brush so they ha you have to do it in a principled and methodical way um, but going back to one of Andy's points around the differentiation for startups and accessing I think this democratization of AI has made that really very difficult because in the past if you were uh, um, you've just put AI in, none of the existing providers were doing anything like that. So it was very easy to do something unique and sell it. And when we started, we were making sort of that sort of proposition. Um, but now you, it's really about the go to market that you have as a strategy, having access to the market, which is really important, which actually plays back to the companies that are already there who can now a lot more readily um, become AI enabled, which they weren't before. So we, so I run an education tech company. We actually went through the deep tech accelerator with in the Warwick Innovation District, worked a lot with Andy. And we have this exact challenge because where we started with the product, which used to be a tutoring platform connecting students with tutors, we were like, yeah, we use AI to match the personality. And we did, it was great. But all of a sudden that's 
now my, my co-founder and I were the other day, I was like, we haven't talked about a hive matching algorithm for the last few months. It's not been front and center. Mm. And it's partly because the system does other things better. <laughs> so our competitive advantage, the reason why we're looking at working with the university further and supplying the, the, the programs that they're delivering is just because the system as a whole is better than the incumbent. And the incumbent's just a patch of loads of different mm. products. So yeah. it comes back to, is AI actually a competitive advantage? And it sounds like it's not anymore. I think it, it, it's a great question. And I think what, what companies are looking at now and thinking about, before ChatGPT, we were looking at using AI in its different forms to just sort of help automation and automate processes to have a, a you know a very simple chat bot to do very simple things on your sort of operational aspects of your business so it wasn't really making a big impact but it was helping i think now what what's happened is companies uh, have realized actually i can to your point i can integrate ai into my product and deliver a new capability and that can serve as a differentiator. But the challenge is everyone's doing this. So it, it, it's sort of, it is a differentiator, but it isn't and because everyone's expecting you to do this now. So it's trying to, and this is why I think businesses are looking at how can we do something special that's very industry focused with this technology? So they're having to not just sort of, you know, call the open AI, API to just integrate chat GPT because anyone can do that to be honest with you that's n not rocket science at all it's how can we do something that's specific to our business specific to the data and the customers that we have and specific to the industry that does act as a differentiator so I think the bar is just rising that you know just using AI is not enough now you've got mm. to figure out how does it solve a real problem a real challenge how does it deliver value to my customers and I think that's where the hard yards are. That's where the effort needs to be. And that's, yeah. that's the challenge. And I think I can add to, to your point that, you know, if you actually have that AI, which is specific to your company and solves a purpose to your customers, you still have that first mover advantage. Yeah. So, so you yeah. still are competitive advantage using AI. So you still can do that. You will still have that first mover advantage if you can design AI in that specific way. Yeah, the challenge is everything is moving so quickly yeah. now. You may only have that advantage exactly. for a few months before, before somebody has... your competitor's doing something similar. So you've then got to do more innovation and more uh, to sort of keep ahead. So that's the big challenge is that it, the, the tech is moving so quickly that you have to constantly yeah. innovate now. Whereas before innovation was almost an optional extra for businesses yeah. Whereas now it's almost, you have to innovate all the time. Yeah. So in a, in a previous world, and I'm going to ask you how you manage this. We were looking in the, I was an engineer in the automotive sector. We were doing work with a big motorcycle company. That's got an aging population. You might be able to guess who they are, <laughs> of riders. But their technicians were actually starting to retire. Hmm. And these are technicians who could walk into an engine dyno and listen and hear exactly and tell you the point at which that engine's gonna blow up. Yeah. The new talent coming in hasn't got that experience and they're losing talent that's already there. So we looked at a proposal of how do you create machine learned or an AI type alternative that can guide and check and you know make sure that the safeguards are in place to support that next generation are there to support the testing of an engine for these bikes so now that's where this is pre chat gpt yeah. plms like all of that stuff this is something that we were looking at doing six months later chat gpt came out and we're like oh, mm. obviously you can't use that but i'm intrigued with yourself um dr marcus in terms of it's not just generative ai there are other bits of ai that exist out there and what are the other things that you're starting to look at and use and implement with patches yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, 
you know, we originally started up um, an AI consultancy back in 2014, which was really a group of PhDs working and solving problems. And, um, but you go into a different area and it's really that domain expertise, which is one of the differentiators. So we worked closely sort of in partnership with um, the companies we were working with to solve those problems together because we didn't have that expertise. So um, I think that is that's still a, a very important aspect. It's not just about having these tools, it's how you about use them in the most effective way. It's understanding people, you know, the way people work and, and do things. So I think that's a really important aspect. Um, the other thing is the data, which really helps incumbents because they have massive amounts of unique data, which ChatGPT and these other large language models are great, but they don't have all the information, proprietary information you do. So when you can fine tune those models specific for your um, domain, that can make it even more powerful. And But again, it's an, it's a situation that makes it very difficult for startups to enter because they don't have access to that information. Data is a really interesting one. At what point does the line get drawn as to you've got too much of my data? Because it, you know, there's a point where it's quite intrusive and people share stuff willy-nilly. We're not, I, I will vouch on, on air that I don't read all those T's and C's. <laughs> and, and I know that WhatsApp's listening to me <laughs> because I'm going to get served ads on something that's relevant to that. So that's a clear bre breach of some form of privacy, like the intrusion of that. And then that data is then used potentially for good or bad, but from an ethical point of view, like surely at some point there's going to be a, a big like halt on everything that's happening because people are fed up with the sheer volumes of data that is personal that's being utilized to train models and i'm not getting any money mm -hmm. for it like you're training yourself your models you're making money like you're using me as a guinea pig right so how how does that balance start to come about or what is there anything that's happening to change that I think people have been giving away data for, you know, even think about you type any th query on the Google, you know, Google is listening to you and that ha they have been using the cookies and the data for, for as long as you know Google or as long internet is there. So, you know, saying that uh, at some point we will not be giving away our data will be, will not, is not going to happen. The question becomes, what is that sensitive data? What is that which I don't want to, you to know? And that would be my social security number in the US or your NHS number here, or, you know, those kinds of really, really tricky details, which I don't want the internet to know. But I think giving away, people have been giving out information and that is how these models have been trained. The, the fine line between, you know, what I really don't want you to know versus, you know, you can train these models on, you know, how humans behave and, you know, how we, we do things is a separate is, is, mm. a, is a separate so it's a, it's a very uh, tricky boundary i think we are we are trying to sort of define here right i mean uh, yeah i mean I, I think it is an interesting area and and i think you know we have been giving away our data for the 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 services that we've been receiving and we've kind of got used to that but i think as we see how valuable our data is, and certainly that's now the case with what's been happening, there is an argument to say, well, there's some value to my information. How can I be rewarded? I think the challenge is there is no commercial driver to build the infrastructure that would be needed to make that capability exist. It's a real shame because that would be an amazing thing, but I just don't think any of the big tech firms have the motivation to do that. And no one from a startup perspective would be able, you know, we could design a system to do that, but they would just be no commercial opportunity to embed that in, which is, a, I think is a real shame and is a miss, you know, missed opportunity, but where, you know, the, the, the horse is bolted as it were, you know, so trying to sort of change everything uh, on that sort of data trust sort of layer of the infrastructure would be really difficult, I think. But it is a shame and, you know, the, the fact that these large language models have like soaked up everything that's on the internet to train them, you know, they've, you know, if you've got anything online, it's probably been used to sort yeah. of feed that, feed that machine as it were. 
so it's already happened what do you do i mean there is work being done to sort of enable certain publishers or certain uh people that want to be able to say i don't want my works to be included so there is work trying to be done on the research side how you can untrain an algorithm on certain bits of data but i think that's a bit of a niche area to be honest with you but yeah it's an interesting one for sure how, how do you manage with things like incorrect information let's say a patient leaves patient access is a there's a whole rule and regulation around request to delete my data mm. yeah so it's an interesting one um the i would say the the biggest thing as we've touched on is people are concerned about who has access to their data and what they're doing with it um and that also a separate thing touches on also cyber security because people are worried about you know getting their data exposed um but in relation to um those sort of data access requests and things um the, generally the data controller is um the healthcare organizations so like the gp practice or the or the hospital and they basically make those decisions on how to to do it in conjunction with with the patient so we we, we follow whatever's requested on that basis how so i'm intrigued by your global perspective because you operate across different sectors like the UN through to here. Are we in a bubble in the UK from a deep tech point of view where we're seeing all the incubation stuff, maybe the US as well, but globally, how, how does deep tech positively impact the UN sustainable goals? For example, like is that, is that starting to permeate through or is it just us in the UK that have the luxury of deep tech because we have the research capability, we have all of that. So, I mean, I, I, I would not agree with the point that we are in a bubble. I think this, this bubble is going to expand as we move forward. Um, uh, we have capabilities, we, we have the, the, the research, uh, and we can actually do really good research. So I, I'll give you an example that recently the United Nations team in the, in, in the, in the UK, they are actually designing these new projects around responsible AI to actually fight various kinds of you know the challenges they have to sort of come up with sustainability goals address those goals to 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 work out solutions for women and and girls and you know and marginalized communities working designing solutions for people who don't have that much privilege in developing countries and things like that so i think moving forward deep tech has this advantage or you know deep tech gives you that that power or the capabilities to actually design solutions which can be used and can be scalable to, to the masses, which are in the developing countries, to marginalized population. The only tricky part, I think, which, which I actually have experience or I think is going to be more and more challenging is designing those guards and rails. So we have a wrapper, we know how to do it, we have the tools. Now the question is how to use those tools mm -hmm. in a much more uh, you know, ethical or responsible way so that it's kind of does more good to you than harm. So I think that's the balance we have to juggle yeah. with. Uh, the other one's adoption of the solution. And I can imagine the, the, the onboarding journey for, for getting someone okay with, with the new system is gonna be a challenge, especially when you think at a global scale. And I think there's, there's an interesting from both of yourselves and, and your involvement. So obviously taking a, your conventional NHS worker who may not be digitally savvy, <laughs> and be like, here you go, this is gonna do all, like 90% of your work for you, I, I just want a clipboard. <laughs> Where's my pager gone? <laughs> uh, but the same as in, in the education space, when it's changing so quickly and things are evolving so quickly, what are the things that start to, that, that start to help? And so I, I wonder if we could start with yourself around. Yeah, and it's, it's a really good point. Um, it's, it's actually funny. It's not the AI that's really been the biggest challenge, really. It's digital transformation that is the biggest challenge. And that's what it, you know, every project you're doing with this to try and optimize productivity and efficiency, it all comes down to a digital transformation project and how you bring the users on board. Um, generally, the, 
we generally design things so they try to work with people so it's like a tool that they use so it's not really trying uh, replacing technology but more an augmenting technology um, but it's getting people to appreciate that buy into that so um, what tends to help we found is um, you have to involve them in the development process and design process you know and ultimately they're the people who know the problem right <laughs> so getting their their experience and input is, is invaluable mm. For me, it's, you know, these kind of projects, the technology is often the easy bit. It's the people and the process. So it's a change program. It's sort of taking, as you say, taking the people on that journey, as it were, so that they're comfortable with the change. They understand how the new way of working is going to work. So, and you do get resistance. People don't like change naturally. So you have to work with them. An interesting thing you mentioned earlier is is sort of how the technology can um, take over sort of capability and that causes problems for the next generation of workers because they don't get exposed and the experience. What I've seen in certain projects is where the technology becomes a training aid for those uh, sort of new new generation of workers. So it's actually guiding them on knowing what the right answer is or you know the, the the particular process they're working on so i've seen projects where the tech the ai technology from the user's perspective they say oh this is really good but it can also be used to train our, our younger colleagues because it's helping them to correct their mistakes and things like that so um, it's sort of often how you perceive the technology as well and how it can be used in different ways. Yeah, interesting. And I think uh, I can add on to your point and the question which is asked to me a lot is that, is AI going to take our jobs away? <laughs> so, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, am I still going to be employed, right? I mean, so yeah. is AI going to take my jobs? And yeah. the question is, which jobs are going to be taken away or is AI going to create more jobs? And I think I'm more positive that the AI is going to create more jobs and it's going to displace that. And, and you know, that the question becomes how, which jobs and, you know, what are the skills you will need to learn as you move forward? So I think that's an interesting area in terms of, you know, augmenting the human AI capabilities together to, to develop this new kind of workforce, which we will actually envision as you move forward. Uh, yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's an interesting thing where obviously when automated looms came in, yes, the industrial revolution, like any, any sort of rapid change from horse-drawn carts to cars, like we change. Humans, that we, we're used to this. This is something we do. What normally happens quite badly though is we forget about the social impact of those who get displaced and aren't taken care of as a result. So to be quite crude, there is, if I run a company and I can make operational savings by bringing AI in, I, I will lay off my staff because I need to drive profit. I'm beholden to my shareholders to drive profit, not to the employees that are then laid off, which doesn't that then cause a potential huge scale wave problem that needs to be addressed up front, like even if it's a tax on use of AI or something to create a pot of funding to support the, the next generation. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And actually, I think the problem is even worse than okay. you think, because with the previous <laughs> industrial revolutions, the technology affected one industry. AI is now affecting every industry. So the there's an element of we're going to use tech to automate the mundane and get rid of the really sort of monotonous work that we just don't want to do anyway and are quite happy to automate it. The technology is going to turn us into superhumans so we can do more quicker, be more productive. But there will be displacement, there will be jobs that disappear, but there will also be new jobs that are created. The challenge is are we able to reskill the people that are displaced to do the new jobs? And that's debatable. But I think the big challenge is with AI compared to other sort of big tech disruptions that we've seen in previous industrial revolutions is that it's not just affecting one industry, it's affecting every industry all at the same time. And we're only at the start of that. Mm. So who knows what's gonna happen five, 10 years time because I think there will be lots of disruption 
Um, and you're right, it's down to the governments to sort of figure out how do we look after our citizens so if they are impacted by this, how, how do we look after them? How do we make sure that they have opportunities to sort of still be, have value in the workplace? Are you seeing this sort of stuff from within the industry you're in in particular? The um, to, to an extent in our industry, but I would say in general, it's something that I'm not very optimistic about. I think there are, there will be some, there are going to be a lot of new jobs and maybe it's my lack of imagination in obviously predicting what all those would be. But as, as Andy said, it's going to replace so many jobs. I don't know how we can um, find alternative um, roles and put in place training programs for, the, for those people. Um, so I, I do think it comes into things but it should make us all a lot more productive. It should make the country wealthy and all that kind of thing. So then you can start looking at things like um, universal basic income and things like that. So maybe it's a situation in the future where people don't necessarily have to work as hard, but they have a much better quality of living because AI is making everything that move. It reduces production costs. We, we don't, shouldn't have to spend as much money on everything. So we should be able to live on less. I mean, you see some of the highest happy countries, like things like some of the Scandinavian countries who really value family time, relaxation, holiday, etc. They they are at the core of their their being. And then work is something that you do. Yeah, of course you need to do it. Mm. But that's their culture. So I think it's a it's a relative thing, isn't it? Where you see the wealth disparity is is a big problem. Yeah. Um, so it depends how it pervades society in general. I think if you feel that you're you've been um, left out and everyone else is moving behind, then that's going to cause um, serious issues. But if if everyone's sort of at a similar level, yeah. then um, perhaps it's less. Of an issue. So we ran a tech boot camp for kids in the local area in Brent. Now, Brent in London is one of the most diverse pop, like groups. You've got super well-off people and, and you've got this really broad spread. And we ran this boot camp and we asked the kids before they signed up and joined, like, you know, what do you want to do? And they were, they were really beat up because the reason we wanted to put it on was to showcase that tech can be accessible. When you've got millions of kids in the UK, or, you know, I think struggling on GCSE maths, you know, the, there are barriers to entry that are far more like, you know, built around the socioeconomic disparity, mm. but then being able to showcase that, you know, you don't necessarily need that. You can prompt engineer and you can start to do these things like that next generation of workforce, that next generation of talent, the current individuals, the kids who can pick up Minecraft and learn what Roblox is and understand blockchain better than an adult could like they're talented but it doesn't seem like in the UK in particular, there is a considered effort. Maybe during the Turing Institute, there are things that are happening, but surely that should be more front and center. I mean, I can give you some examples about, you know, the, the way technology, I'm, I'm not just AI, any technology for that matter has changed. So the kind of disparities we have, so for instance, the idea is if you are rich, if you have the, the means, you will actually go to a private school, you will actually get good education, that will lead to you a good job and so on and so forth, and eventually you will be well off. On the contrary, if you are not that well off, then you will not have good education, and that kind of, those disparities are even heightened in developing countries more so than here. However, I mean, the, the, this barrier to good education is being broken away with the access to these free courses. So for instance, MIT actually offers all their courses free. So it doesn't matter even if you don't go to MIT, you can still have the MIT courses if you want to take those courses. It is all on the on your you know tip of your finger. So you can actually access those courses online. So the so the point I'm sort of making is that technology has given the means and the medium to actually break that uh, that sort of inequality that you know if you are rich you will have access to good education not necessarily you can actually have access to good education even through these coursera many of these free courses online and even a lot of these you know top universities are giving away these courses for free so you can actually have education and i think that is something to think about that if you have education that kind of changes everything so that gives you all means and mediums you know you will have job you will have so on and so forth your kids can go to school you will have so 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 i think so technology kind of changes uh, the perspective or you know the the way moving forward right i mean so uh, one 
One of my sort of bugbears, though, is that um, I find education doesn't really move fast enough with the times. I mean, long, you know, I worked in finance, I did a PhD in maths. I don't do manual long division, right? You know, I have my phone, I have a calculator. So it's not really a useful skill to learn a lot of the different things. That a lot of things are quite antiquated, not really moving with the times. You know, we see, talk about how chat GPT is used um, now um, by students to do their homework and things but that needs to be embraced that's the new reality right we need to involve the way we're teaching not try to catch people out oh you've used that so it doesn't count yeah. you know we've moved into a new paradigm we need to involve education with it these are the tools that should make us we should be able to leapfrog a lot of learning that we did that was basic that was not any use today i, I totally agree with that and actually when you think about it we need to be really good at human education because the the artificial intelligence is evolving very quickly so if we don't improve how we educate our next generations there's going to be a massive difference between the the AI capability and the human intelligence okay this really worries me right because mm. fast forward 50 years the AI technology is going to be so good compared to where we are as humans that I, I really worry that that's a massive issue. And we need to address the educational system now to say we've got to make all of our everyone to a much higher level of yeah. education. And I think this is one of the, you know, we've got climate change, we've got all these other sort of global crises. I think education is, is the unspoken uh, sort of issue as well, to yeah. be honest. My, my belief has always been, when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you've got poverty, the, the shelter, the clothing, yeah. the air, all that stuff at the bottom. Education for me is the one that if you pull that thread correctly, you can unlock all of it. Yeah. And that's similar to AI. If we use it yeah. correctly, we can unlock all of the global. And that's my optimistic approach to this. It's got to be because, you know. Yeah. And, and here's where, you know, just to change track a little bit, the innovation being spun out right now is what's going to change the world in the future. And yet it doesn't feel like there's enough being done. But from your experience with the deep tech incubator, I don't know if you could share some of the things that you are seeing or the approach or things that are being done to drive that next wave of innovation to really take hold and, and change all those bottom tier fundamental problems that we as a race are facing. Yeah, and I, I think so as part of, so I chair the Deep Tech Innovation Center, which provides a sort of six month part-time program for startup founders and we help them both on the business and on the technical side to develop their ideas and sort of help them sort of create a more sort of commercial opportunity for their research and their ideas but the the great thing is we kind of think that innovation has to come from the big tech firms but actually great ideas can come from anywhere and I think, you know, as a, as a nation of innovators, I'm very proud to be British because we have a long history of being very inventive, coming up with new ideas and new technologies. And I think I'm keen to nurture that in the next generation so that we can come up with even more fantastic ideas that can disrupt all sorts of industries, whether that's education, whether it's med tech, fintech wherever it is i think there's so much more to be done and while we're obsessed with you know chat gpt and sort of ai at the moment there is still so much more to be done with ai that we're only at the very start of this mm. so i think the next 20 30 years there's going to be huge transformation in capability and i think there'll be lots of companies that we're starting to seed now that in 5, 10, 15 years time will come up with some amazing capabilities and, and abilities that will potentially be the next unicorn and, and yeah it's a fantastic time. Final question I was going to ask you to close up was if you could have a magic wand and you could remove any barrier to what you're doing currently, the information of technology or or the landscape, you know, a policy. What is it? We'll start with 
That's Marcus. I wanted more time to think there, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think one of the biggest barriers to, to companies in the UK and Europe is usually around funding. Um, you see the um, US guy, guys, they just go so much quicker and then they move into the UK and European markets and they becomes quite difficult to compete where we're doing lots of really cool and interesting things but um, if we don't have that support both from um, the government from external funding to be able to to grow like that then it's you know yeah. usually get bought out is usually the way it goes or then just yeah. taken over by one of the bigger companies I agree to that one <laughs> I think I, I need more time too so but uh, but if you ask me honestly, I mean, I think this whole idea about responsible AI, uh, we need more, more regulation and we need um, you know, better ways to train the data. We don't have that yet, you know. So I think that would be my one, one cent. Yeah, I, for me, it is funding as well, because I think the, uh, the UK has such a great ecosystem of innovation and great ideas but we don't have the funding environment that the US has where they, the, the funding here is a lot more risk averse and so the, uh, the opportunity for startups to really sort of get that great first you know momentum is, is much more challenging. Um, so it'd be great to see uh, that improve. I think we've certainly this year seen a lot of challenges in that space. And I think, um, you know, we see lots of huge investment into the big sort of uh, existing businesses and startups, um, not least because the infrastructure around AI needs a huge investment. But I think that's sacrificed some of the early stage investments. Um, uh, so it would be good to see a better ecosystem around that. So um, that's my hope for the future. Nice. I match funding, I match the, the responsible AI, the training. But my bit is going to have to be the education piece. Mm. I think we are on a cliff edge. And if we don't do something about it in a considered way, build a task force, get the right policies in place, invest in that next generation, we will not be in a position where we have, we can actually deal with the, the new innovations coming on. So, because no one's gonna be working on those solutions. So, but I think combined, we're getting close. So uh, thank you very much everyone for tuning in. It's been a really fascinating conversation. I hope you've all enjoyed the time as well. And it's been the My Innovation podcast and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode.